So ladies and gentlemen, I give you the 24th annual Henry George speaker, Brad DeLong. Thank you very much. Um, let me start by seeing if I can arrange all the machines um, I was hoping to look at up here. Um, and I suppose, let me see if I can pull something down from the internet. Um, only because that looks like a better place no, to look for it. And yes, looks good. Good so far. Nope, not so good. Ah, uh, yes, that looks considerably better. Okay, now we have at least what I wanted to take a look at, at least on this screen. Um, and now let me open up this one. Um, so I can take a look at an entirely separate um, set of notes as well. Bingo, yes, excellent. Um, we stand here, um, we stand here in the middle of the worst downturn of the post-World War II era. We stand here in the middle of the worst episode of economic distress that has been seen since the end of World War II. And it is in some ways very strange, um, very strange that we stand here, that we didn't expect to be standing here. We thought, um, we thought two years ago that we knew well enough how the world economy worked that we weren't going to get to the largest recession, to a quasi-depression, to an extraordinary episode of economic instability, um, and yet we have. Um, so the first question that I want to talk about tonight is how we have managed to wind up here um, in this peculiar, unusual, and most of all, extraordinarily unexpected situation. How is it that we wound up in something that, although it's not a Great Depression, is a close cousin to it? And second, um, second, I'm going to want to ask, what can we do about it? What should we be doing that we're not doing? Um, how should we be dealing with the current crisis in a way that we're not dealing with it? Um, <coughs> How can I get this right? Um, a little bit higher. And can we see this well enough? Oh, yes, we can. It looks better on this. Uh, how is it that we've gotten ourselves into a situation where we have this large <coughs> plunging um, spike on our graph at the far right as the U.S. economy has headed into deep recession, as the employment to population ratio in America has collapsed. For we are now in the worst recession of the post-World War II era, making this a very bad time to be entering the labor market or losing your job and looking for another one in the United States and also a very bad time to be entering the labor market or losing your job anywhere else in the world. For as demand in the United States has fallen, the United States' role as the global economy's importer of last resort and safe haven for finance has meant that its recessions carry the whole globe right down with it. And this is also a very bad time to be a macroeconomic theorist. Um, take practically any economics textbook. Try to use it to figure out what's happening in the world outside right now, and you come up pretty dry. Take any introductory economics principles text. It is not of much greater help. 
perform the difficult and arcane task of reading the technical papers that we make graduate students read in their first and second years of macroeconomics courses, and you gain little um, of use that the economic theories we professional economists have been typically teaching over the past decade do not do their job uh, of helping us to understand the world in which we are now living. Now, in part, this is because the current global recession is a very different animal than the other recessions of the post-World War II world that we had grown used to. In the textbooks, at least, since World War II, Global recessions had been caused, or at least courted, by the actions of North Atlantic central banks. The Federal Reserve, the European Central Bank, the Bank of England, decide that monetary policy has been too stimulative, too lax, that supply shocks have carried the prices of natural resources upward too high, that there is great danger of a very damaging global inflationary spiral, and that as a result, we need to shift policies from putting first priority on maintaining employment to first priority on maintaining or recovering the credibility as guardians of effective price stability. And when central banks decided to make their price stability mission their highest priority, they sold safe treasury bonds for cash, thus they shrank the amount of cash in the economy, um, increasing the duration of the assets the private sector must hold, and decreasing how much assets those impatient to spend could hold and feel safe. Um, and as a result, spending fell, and as spending falls, unemployment rises, wage and resource prices stop rising or fall, and the threat of an inflationary spiral falls away. The central banks have, in the words of William McChesney Martin, chair of America's Federal Reserve Board from 1951 to 1970, taken away the alcoholic punch bowl before the party gets going. According to my Berkeley colleagues, David Romer and Christina Romer, both of whom you've seen here, this type of recession courting recession, triggering shift in priorities on the part of the Federal Reserve Open Market Committee, it's the cause of six of the nine post-World War II recessions. The first six big downward movements in the employment to population ratio since World War II that we see in this graph here. However, they say the last two, when they were writing, the last three now, um, the last three are different. Um, they don't have their origins in a central bank decision that it's time to change priorities and fight inflation. Instead, they have their origins in an endogenous collapse on the part of financial markets in their confidence, in their willingness to hold risky assets. Um, a few very rough numbers for where we are right now. 26 months ago, we had in the world roughly $80 trillion of global financial assets. Today, we have roughly $60 trillion on net of traded global financial assets. We can summarize the determinants of financial asset values as the result of five forces. Um, par values, that is book or construction, con or construction values, and then four discounts. Some um, discounts for default, duration, risk, and information. The default discount is your counterparty might simply not pay you. You might go to them and say, you owe us money, and they might say, tough, we can't pay. Um, the duration discount is that money in the future, even certain money of insured purchasing power in the future, is not worth cash in hand today. The third discount, the risk discount, is perhaps when you get your money, it will be a state of the world in which your marginal utility of wealth is low. And so you really don't care that much that you've got your money. Or worse, that you will lose your money in a state of the world in which your marginal utility of wealth is high in which case you feel the pain really strongly. And fourth, perhaps you lack information. Um, perhaps your counterparty knows something important about the asset that you do not. Um, if it's such a good idea for them to sell it to you at this price, why is it a good idea for you to buy? Situations in which you don't know as much about your counterparty are situations in which you should apply deep discounts to your valuations. For as Sky Masterson's father told him, 
that, son, someday someone will come up to you with a deck of cards fresh from the factory, still in its seal, and bet you that he can make the jack of diamonds jump out of that deck and squirt cider in your ear. Son, when the man does this, do not take this bet. That's the fourth of these discounts. Now, um, of the U, $20 trillion decline in the value of global financial asset values we have seen during this crisis, only a small part, um, one trillion to two trillion, comes from increasing default discounts on the driving factor behind the crisis. Losses on mortgages and mortgage-backed securities made on homes overbuilt in the desert between Los Angeles and Albuquerque due to irrational exuberance in global housing markets. There are perhaps another four trillion in other defaults springing from the fact that because the global economy is in recession, other companies are failing and won't pay their debts. But were there no recession, those losses wouldn't be there. And those losses have been offset by $4 trillion that should have been gains in global financial asset values because central banks have flooded the zone with liquidity, have done everything they possibly can to push asset prices up, and have only managed to neutralize the $4 trillion loss um, due to increases in defaults. Um, the net effect, um, increases in risk and information discounts account for 90% of net global financial asset losses. Um, the first order factor in our crisis is not its trigger. Its trigger was overinvestment in housing or default on mortgage-backed securities. But that has created a situation in which all over the world, investors and financiers are terrified of holding risky assets, and thus a situation in which businesses that could normally seek to expand um, find they cannot get financing on terms that make expansion profitable. And that is the source, uh, that is the source of our problem. Um, now, how has the economics profession reacted right, um, to this kind of particular coming crisis? Um, well, earlier, um, earlier today, I talked about the four factions currently active in modern policy-oriented macroeconomics in the wake of the collapse of the world economy and of reality's rude disproving of economists' smug confidence that they had learned enough about economic policy to finally stabilize the world economy, to finally create the great moderation. And then even I, I was told I should push my afternoon and evening talk as far apart as I could because a bunch of people who came to the afternoon one would also come to the evening one. Over the past week, the two have crept closer together. So let me try to briefly summarize a lot of what I said earlier this afternoon at much shorter length. But for those of you who are bored because they were here this afternoon and paying attention, my apologies. Feel free to go to sleep um, for about 10 minutes. So there were four factions. Um, the first faction were, call them the Greenspanists, because they had been riding high while Alan Greenspan was chairman of the Federal Reserve Board. Um, the Greenspanists, um, the Greenspanists believed the Federal Reserve should focus on pumping up demand to keep employment as high as possible without running any significant risk of an inflationary spiral, and that the government should furthermore rely largely on investor self-interest, um, on investor self-interest in order to, um, investor self-interest to minimize fraud and excessive leverage, and if the relatively expansionary monetary and the hands-off regulatory policies of the Greenspanists, if they led to a bubble which then collapsed, well, the Federal Reserve had the tools to step in and contain the damage, keeping disruption in financial markets from spilling over to the real economy and causing mass unemployment, that after all, there had been financial crises or near financial crises in the United States in 1987, in 1991, in 1998, and in 2000. Um, the hayne leland collapse of portfolio insurance collapse of the stock market in one day is the first. The savings and loan crisis is the second. The bankruptcy of long-term capital management is the third. And the collapse of the dot-com bubble is the fourth. 
And in all four cases, the Federal Reserve stepped in, cleaned up the mess, and kept there from being any significant shift in the amount of the American population that was at work. Right? The recessions that followed these crises or near crises were either non-existent or were short and shallow. And the Greenspanists argued that all that happened was we simply had bad luck this time. Um, that policies were sound, we were just terrifically unlucky, we're not going to be that unlucky again, we should continue with business as usual. Unfortunately for the Greenspanists, they appear rather weak now because Alan Greenspan is staggering around saying that he has misjudged the economy and that he himself needs to rethink what he believed. So those people who are still on his side um, are facing a kind of absence of banners to follow. Um, so one faction are these Greenspanists. Second faction is the people I call the punch bowlers. After William McChesney Martin's statement that the Federal Reserve exists to take away the punch bowl before the party really gets rolling. As opposed to Alan Greenspan's doctrine, which is that as long as there's no big inflation, who cares what's happening to asset prices? that as long as there's no inflation on the consumer price index, the Federal Reserve can spike the punch bowl with the grain alcohol of low interest rates and excessive monetary expansion as much as it wants to and let the party get really wild and exciting. And if things turn out badly afterwards, well, the Federal Reserve exists as designated sober driver to drive everybody home. <laughs> um, the punch bowl spoilers do not believe this. Um, they believe that under normal circumstances, investors' self-interest and due diligence would properly minimize fraud and excessive leverage, but that excessively easy monetary policy and excessively low interest rates are a temptation no financial market can exist, are a source of irrational exuberance. Hence, they say the big mistake was in making monetary policy be too loose, in trying to pursue full employment too aggressively. That in the future, whenever the Federal Reserve considers monetary policy, it must, not also, it must not just ask, should the unemployment rate be a little bit lower? It should also ask, can financial markets take another reduction of interest rates without running a risk of a bubble? And if they say, no, they cannot, then the fact that unemployment is higher than in some sense should be is bad luck, but there's nothing we can do about it. It is our karma. And the third school of thought, you know, the producerists, um, of whom Henry George would definitely have been one were he alive today. That is, the rewards to financial speculation today would arouse the same suspicion in him that the rewards to urban real estate speculation on the lands lapped by the waters east of the Golden Gate and north of the Verrazano Narrows um, aroused in him in the 19th century. The producerists have yet a third view. Um, that they say finance has a whole bunch of functions for which it needs bonds, stocks, plain vanilla mortgages, savings accounts, checking accounts, credit cards, um, but that everything else is pointless. At best, it's a zero-sum casino, a kind of non-glitzy, non-pretty equivalent of Las Vegas. At worst, um, finance is an extraordinary dissipation of national wealth and a cruel hoax on many of the customers of the financial sector who are made to bear risks that they have no business bearing and are made to bear such risks by not understanding what they are doing. And it needs to be tightly regulated both for the sake of customers in normal times and for the sake of us all in the aftermath of financial crises. As the head of the producerists at the Federal Reserve, the late Fed Governor Ned Gramlich said to Alan Greenspan back in 2003, that all of these homeowners buying homes on subprime mortgages in the desert outside of Los Angeles are being made to bear enormous risks of interest rate changes. And they have no business bearing such risks. The financial markets should not be allowing them to do so. These particular contracts are not contracts they should be signing. To which Alan Greenspan responded, how long is the Federal Reserve likely to stay an independent institution? if we could pick up lenders who want to lend and borrowers who want to borrow and move from two-bedroom um, apartments in Venice Beach into four-bedroom houses in San Bernardino, if we step in and say, we don't care that you want to lend and you want to borrow, we're the Fed, we're the government, we're not going to let you. Um, 
A fierce potential debate um, carried on largely in private in the run-up to 2007, which has changed substantially since it all came crashing down. And when it did come crashing down, Greenspanists, punchbowlists, and producerists all, however, agreed that the current crisis called for extraordinary and stimulative policy measures, that normal monetary stabilization policy by the Federal Reserve via open market operations, controlling the money stock by buying bonds for cash when it wants spending to rise and selling bonds for cash when it wants spending to fall, you know, are not equal to this crisis. Therefore, we need an appropriate and well-implemented mix of extraordinary policies, you know, a host of stimulus programs, using quantitative easing, um, using quantitative easing to banish any fears of possible future deflation, um, using banking sector recapitalization to raise the private sector's diminished risk tolerance and make banks willing to hold more risky assets, providing government guarantees and having the government purchase assets to reduce the burden of risk the private market must bear, and running larger government deficits in the short run, fueling direct government spending to try to reduce unemployment as well. And these three factions fight fiercely among themselves as to what appropriate mix and well-implemented means, but they are as a group opposed by a fourth faction um, that has appeared over the past year, those who will have none of such extraordinary stimulative policy measures. I don't yet have a good name for them, um, so I'm choosing a derogatory name and I'm calling them the nihilists uh, because they're saying no to the extraordinary policies that everyone else thinks are desirable at this stage. And also, when I try to get them to explain their arguments, um, they seem to say no as well. They don't come up with anything that I regard as especially coherent. Um, and they believe there's no point um, to special banking sector policies. Quote, this bank bailout issue, one of them wrote, I really don't get it. The right public policy is some sort of accelerated bankruptcy proceedings. Just to say to make the banks well on all the money they've lost over this thing, I just, I do not get it. And would a fiscal stimulus add another weapon? If the government builds a bridge and the Fed prints up some money to pay the bridge builders, that's just a monetary policy. The only part of the stimulus package that's stimulating um, is the monetary part. And earlier today, um, I said I thought the nihilists were going to lose the intellectual debate you know, and rapidly disappear. But they have placed too many empirical bets that the Federal Reserve was unwarranted in its panicking for no good reason in the summer of 2008, and that the extraordinary stimulative fiscal and banking policies in the U.S. and elsewhere in 2008 and 2009 will have absolutely no effect, they said. And those reputational bets are going wrong, um, and they'll be seen to have gone wrong. And the theoretical arguments, as I said before, um, well, they are incomprehensible to me at least, and not just to me, um, that let me quote Carl Smith of UNC Chapel Hill on two of the nihilists, right? um, Eugene Fama um, and John Cochran. Quote, beginning with Eugene Fama's arguing the stimulus could not work, I have been deeply puzzled. The probability that I understand macro on a deeper level than Fama or Cochran is low, yet it seems to me that basic error is being made by assuming that increases in the demand for money do not reduce right, the quantity of transactions. Um, yet, given the premise that it is unlikely I understand something Fama and Cochrane do not, the logical conclusion is that I am missing something. Um, and I share Carl Smith's worries. That is, those I have termed the nihilists are not stupid. They include at least two past Nobel laureates, and I suspect at least one future one. And two years ago, I'd have said they contain much more than one um, future one. So to put my worries at ease, I need to have a theory of where the nihilists are coming from and why they are so wrong. Um, so let me now take, pick up the thread that I dropped earlier this afternoon, that the people who came before can wake up, because I'm going to say something new. And let me detour for a minute or two to sketch my view of the origins um, of the school um, and to justify my decision to, by and large, ignore what they have to say for the main lesson of my talk, 
which is about the lessons for future macroeconomic policy from the crisis of 2007. Um, I guess we now have to say um, 2007 to 2010. Um, don't we? It's pretty clear this is not going to be over by 2009. Um, back when we first started talking about it, it was the financial panic of 2007. Then it was the crisis of 2007-8. Then it was the Great Recession of 2007-2009. Um, and I kind of hope we'll still be calling it the Great Recession of 2007-2009 at this time next year. I don't want to live in a world in which we're calling it something else. Um, so um, if you ask a modern economic historian, like, say, me, um, what is going on right now? Um, why is the world currently in the grips of a financial crisis and a deep downturn? I will say that I have a rough guess and some substantial knowledge of the answer, and I'll give you this answer. Um, I will say that this is the latest episode in a long history of similar episodes of bubble, crash, crisis, recession, dating back at least to the canal bubble of the early 1820s in Britain, to the 1825-6 failure of Pole Thornton and Company, and to the subsequent first industrial recession ever in Great Britain. I would say we've seen this process at work in many other historical episodes as well. 1873 with the collapse of the U.S. Investment Bank of J. Cook and Company, 1890 with the first Bering Brothers crisis, 1929 and 2000 with the collapse of the dot-com bubble. And that for the reason is that for any one of a number of reasons, asset prices get way out of whack and rise to unsustainable levels. Sometimes the culprit is lousy internal controls in financial firms that over-reward subordinates for taking risk, as in the employees of Bering Brothers, who were supposed to sell Argentinian bonds on the London Stock Exchange, but decided since they couldn't get what they regarded as high enough bonds for their... For their high enough prices for the bonds that they would keep them in the bank's portfolio instead. Right? Big mistake. And six months later, they would have been glad to have sold the bonds at any price, but they couldn't. Sometimes it is government guarantees that convince financial businesses that really ought to be more cautious to kind of swing for the fences, and financial businesses that are already in trouble to gamble for resurrection. That is, if the government's already paying, and if you're already broke, then why not gamble? After all, heads you win, tails the government pays. That's the story behind the U.S. savings and loan crisis of 1990. Sometimes it's the selection of the market as a long run of good fortune leaves the financial market dominated by cockeyed, unrealistic over-optimists. They, after all, were the ones who were long and leveraged risky assets, and when risky assets go up, they profit and have much, much more money to make the next round of bets. While the sober or the pessimistic, who were short or neutral, well, they've lost all their money. Um, they're no longer there. Plus, in addition, you have the destabilizing factor of people on the sidelines watching other people who are no smarter than they are, and certainly no hard, more, more harder working than they are, getting really rich. As my teacher Charlie Kindleberger used to say when he gave this version of his talk, he would say, there is nothing more disconcerting, disturbing, and deranging of your own mental state than to see your friends become fabulously wealthy. <laughs> and in Manhattan, he'd always get a laugh, and it would always be a nervous laugh um, when he said this. Um, then the crash comes. And when the crash comes, the risk tolerance of the private market collapses. Everyone knows that there are immense, unrealized losses in financial assets and nobody is sure they know where they are. Thus, the crash is followed by a very large flight to safety. No one wants to hold their portfolio in risky assets. Everyone wants to hold their portfolio in safe assets. The flight to safety is followed by a steep fall in the velocity of money, as investors everywhere ask, what's the safest asset of all? Cash. Um, what should I do with my cash? Well, I should hold on to it rather than spend it. Uh, when cash is no longer something burning a hole in your pocket so that you're anxious to spend so that you can get some use out of it, either spend it on some consumer good or trade it away to someone else so you can invest in some higher yielding investment, if you think all the higher yielding investments are too risky, you'll hold on to your cash, you won't spend it, and then total spending will fall 
and when total spending falls, the employment to population ratio does the dance it went at the far right of the graph I put up at the start. Now, I won't say this is the pattern of all recessions. It isn't. But I will say that this is the pattern of this recession, and it's a pattern that by now we ought to be familiar with because we've seen episodes of it since 1825. We have been here before. And that's the economic historian story. If, by contrast, you ask the same question of a modern macroeconomist, like, say, the extremely sharp Nariana Kocher Lakota of the University of Minnesota, you'll find that he says that he does not know, quote, why do we have business cycles? Why do asset prices move around so much? Macroeconomics has little to offer by way of answer to these questions, unquote. He will say there are various models that attribute economic downturns to various causes, Quote, most modern models in macroeconomics rely on some form of large quarterly movements in the technological frontier. Some have collective shocks to the marginal utility of leisure. Other models have large quarterly shocks to the depreciation rate in the capital stock in order to generate high asset price volatilities, unquote. Now, who understood that? <laughs> All right. Um, what Nariana Kocher Lakota is saying is that people who build complicated theoretical models in which everyone's income adds up and all of people's decisions are consistent given the information they have, find that they have to do one of three things to their models to both generate a model that they can solve and analyze on the one hand and generate a model with big business cycles in it on the other. Um, they can get a significant downturn if they impose on the economy a great forgetting, that people suddenly just forget how to do things. They forget 3% of their ability to produce. They forget 3% of their technological and organizational knowledge. So the same amount of capital and the same number of workers are all of a sudden producing 3% less. That that's how they can start a business cycle. They can produce a business cycle if they impose on the people in their model a great vacation, a sudden extra taste for leisure, say a model of the Australian economy in which everyone all of a sudden learns to surf. Um, or they say they can get a big recession and one that looks rather like this one if they impose a great rusting on the economy. If they say the speed with which oxygen in the air corrodes um, large things made of metal all of a sudden speeds up so that every piece of capital equipment rusts much, much faster. Um, that that's what they have to do in order to produce models that match current, current um, say, standards for consistency and yet also produce large fluctuations. Um, but Nariana Kocher Lakota will then go on to say that all these strike him as implausible just so stories that do not illuminate much. Um, as not to be taken fully seriously, quote. That the sources of disturbances in macroeconomic models are, to my taste, patently unrealistic. None of these disturbances seem compelling as descriptions of the world, to put it mildly, unquote. And further, that nobody really believes them, quote. Macroeconomists use them only as convenient shortcuts to generate the requisite levels of volatility in endogenous variables. Um, who understood that? Um, all right, this really is Nariana's and to some degree my native dialect by now. That sentence doesn't sound odd to me at all after 30 years in this business. Um, what he means is that imposing these peculiar things on your model is the only way to get them to behave consistently and still produce large fluctuations in employment and production like those that we saw in the figure right? I'd put up. Um, so this is a problem. Um, and so what do you do if you're a modern cutting edge macroeconomist and you must somehow produce an opinion on a question of what public policy should be? Um, now some people take their models very seriously indeed. Thus we have Ed Prescott of Arizona State saying he really does believe that big recessions are the result of a great forgetting or something similar. For example, he says, the reason the world went into a Great Depression was because of, quote, Herbert Hoover's anti-market, anti-globalization, anti-immigration, pro-cartelization policies that disrupted the ability of the market to produce. And Casey Mulligan of the University of Chicago is indeed writing in the New York Times last fall, 
that if we were in a recession, it would be because of all the things the government would do to make it less rewarding to work. Like the fact that if you quit your job, you can then get a better deal on refinancing your house. Uh, now that doesn't account for 5% of the American population suddenly finding themselves without jobs. Right? You go out across America today looking for someone who quit their job and hasn't looked for another one because they'll get a better deal on refinancing their house if they're poorer. And they'll say, no, that's not, um, that's really not what they're about. Um, but the most are with Coacher Lakota. Um, right, to say that Alan Greenspan at the Federal Reserve and Herbert Hoover were the most destructive anti-market interventionist policymakers ever, and that's why we have such big recessions under them, you know, really doesn't pass a laugh test. Um, the current recession is not because government has suddenly and materially stepped up the pace of its destructive anti-market interventions. The current recession is not the result of a great forgetting. It is not a great vacation. It is not the result of a great rusting. Um, so what do you do? If you believe in cutting edge macro, yet do not take your cutting edge models to be well enough developed to be guides to policy analysis. Um, and one possibility is to return to older non-cutting edge models, models that people nevertheless used for policy analysis in earlier days to go back to the history of economic thought and pull things off the shelf, blow off the dust, polish them up and still if they say the old work. Return to Irving Fisher's quantity theory, to Milton Friedman's quantity theory, to Newt Vixell's market and natural rate of interest, which I once saw Alan Greenspan terrify eight congressmen by deploying those concepts unexpectedly in the middle of a hearing, um, to John Hicks's ISLM model and its many New Keynesian descendants, and so forth. And that's what the economists who are Greenspanists, producerists, and punch bowlers discussed above do. The nihilists are those who have closed this door. A second possibility is to use your knowledge of past history to draw analogies and make inferences. Um, that is, I think, much of what Christy Romer of the CEA and Ben Bernanke at the Federal Reserve do these days. Indeed, it sometimes looks better to have not a model of the financial crisis, but instead knowledge of past financial crises and an ability to make analogies on the fly. At least those people who do this appear to be more coherent and to have more credibility than others in meeting these days. Last week at the Economic History Association, Charlie Kindleberger from Columbia, um, no, not Charlie Kindleberger, Charlie Calamiris from Columbia, talked about how he wins every meeting in Washington now by saying, well, my, my recollection of the Overend Gurney crisis in 1866 is such and so, so I don't think that would work. Um, and he says it's kind of like he holds Trumps, that every word that comes out of his mouth is a Trump because he's the only person in the room who knows the financial history. Um, but this door is closed to the nihilists as well. Um, Eugene Fama, for example, is a man who has never read um, the Hyman Minsky um, line of research book, Manias, Panics, and Crashes, that Charlie Kindleberger, my old teacher, read, um, wrote, which is the best book ever written on financial crises and their macroeconomic implications. Fama is, he says, unfamiliar with that entire line of work, you know, which shuts off the argument from historical analogies. The third possibility is to try to roll your own analysis from first principles, whatever those may be, um, without reading the relevant literature and indeed often without knowing there is a relevant literature. And the natural consequence is that you make what can only be called mistakes, obvious mistakes um, to my mind, mistakes that were identified such in the 1920s if not earlier. Um, thus we have one nihilist who confuses levels and derivatives in his claim that once GDP is no longer falling, all extraordinarily stimulative policies should be ended. Another who thinks there's something logically inconsistent in a model in which aggregate planned expenditure is greater than income, even though all of Milton Friedman's models were always of that character. Um, economists who don't understand that you know, Robert Barrow's Ricardian equivalence, although it can apply on the tax side, does not in general apply on the spending side except when, the gov when what the government buys with its money is exactly what private consumers would have bought with the money had they had it instead. Um, Eugene Fama does not understand the logical status of the savings investment identity, um, etc. Now, um, 
I don't think this is an adequate understanding of this particular current of thought. That um, people who are unfamiliar with the literature and do not do their homework will make mistakes. Yeah, but why these mistakes? Uh, and why the tone? Um, I mean, Ed Prescott says that, um, and John Cochran say that, you know, the idea that fiscal policy can matter for spending is a fairy tale that has not been taught to graduate students for a generation. Um, and yet I look next door at Maury Obstfeld, uh, who teaches that fiscal policy matters to really existing graduate students um, every year in the fall. Um, now, I mean, Maury Obstfeld is not terribly troubled by claims that the fiscal policy models of Obstfeld and Rogoff are fairy tales, and is not terribly troubled by the, the, um, by the claim that the graduate students of UC Berkeley he teaches do not really exist. And most of the rest of us are untroubled by Ed Prescott's claims that we teach at a third-rate institution and are not advancing the science. Uh, and indeed, if um, Ed Prescott thought we were advancing a science in which the reason for the Great Depression was that Herbert Hoover was a socialist, um, we would be really worried. Um, and why the certainty? Yeah, um, I know that my confidence in my estimate of the strength and effectiveness of any of these extraordinary stimulative policies is relatively low. Uh, my confidence in the power of the fiscal multiplier is not great. It could be any of a number of things ranging from two down to maybe it's zero under some circumstances. My confidence interval for the effectiveness of banking policies and of quantitative easing is similarly large. Yet the nihilists seem to have a God-given certain belief that the impact of all of these extraordinarily stimulative policies is zero. And where does that come from? Um, these are all questions I cannot answer, but still this is the best, yeah, um, this is the best that I can do for now. And it does put my conscience, um, does put my conscience somewhat at ease. So now this gets us um, to the current state of play. That I don't understand the nihilists. Um, I think they will vanish because they have placed too many bad reputational bets that are now coming due. Right? The, Forecasters who track the stimulus package says that it did indeed add three percentage points to the growth rate in the second quarter of this year and is probably having the same effect in the third quarter. Um, countries that undertook larger fiscal stimuluses and did more to rescue their banking systems are indeed doing better than countries that are doing less. Um, and so there are too many bad reputational bets where people are now rolling snake eyes and crapping out. And then when that happens, right, the three-cornered cage match that I thought would begin a year ago um, will begin anew. That what do we know and what should we do later, in which Greenspanists, producerists, and punch bowlers um, go at it. And um, here I have a very hard time picking a side um, because I feel the force of all of their arguments. Indeed, I'm a repentant and not a true, not a completely or truly repent, repentant Greenspanist. Um, I still feel the song and I still feel in some sense that he was right, that the subprime mortgage crisis should not have brought down the world economy. You know, after all, the dot-com bubble saw investors in high tech and in telecommunications lose two trillion of wealth. How can two trillion of wealth be swallowed by the world economy with barely a burp? while 500 billion of wealth invested in subprime mortgages and lost can cause right, the enormous but slow motion crash right, that we see outside this room. Um, it's a question. Um, it's a hard question and I don't have a terribly good answer to it. Um, I do know that it's pretty clear how we should deal with this crisis. Um, which is that we've reached a stage in which normal monetary policy, in which the Federal Reserve's open market operations, by which it you know, um, buys bonds for cash and thus puts more cash in the pockets of people, and as this cash burns a hole in your pocket, because after all, you could be investing it in something more lucrative, you spend it, and that's the way the Federal Reserve boosts up spending, that that doesn't work now, 
And that doesn't work now because the interest rates on safe assets are so low that you put cash in someone's pocket and ask them, do you want to spend it? Um, and they say, no, I don't want to spend it. I'm happy having it in my pocket. And they say, do you want to have a higher, do you want to move it into a higher um, yielding asset and trade it to someone else who will spend it? And then they'll say, no, I don't like any of the higher yielding assets. I've already lost 50% of my portfolio. I can't afford to lose the rest at all. Um, you want me to buy bonds? Well, interest rates might go up and then the price of bonds will go down. I want to keep my money in cash because that way I know that it's safe. Um, so the standard monetary policy tools that we use to try to control spending, well, they don't work, or at least there's a very large probability that they won't work right now. Um, in which case, you deal with this crisis um, through a diversified strategy. That one of the first principles of finance is when you're uncertain, diversification is good. And so diversified stimulative policies seems to be a good thing to try. Um, you don't know which of the alternatives you might put forward are best, you know, so try them all at some level and hope that some of them work and reinforce success. Um, so how do you deal with this crisis? First, by having the government guarantee um, existing assets, existing private risky assets. Government guarantees create more safe assets in the economy and when the supply of anything goes up, in this case safe assets, their price goes down. When the price of safe assets like treasury bonds goes down, well, the interest rates on those treasury bonds go up. And as interest rates go up, people with cash in their pockets begin to say, hey, the treasury interest rate is approaching a normal level again. I should either spend this cash in my pocket or move it into some treasury bond. This is no longer the right thing for me to hold. And that will boost spending, that will push spending up and help pull us out of the recession. There's banking sector recapitalization. Um, if you give the banks more money, then they won't be as scared of losses, and so their demand for safe assets will go down. And as their demand for safe assets goes down, well, that also lowers the price, et cetera, et cetera. It's the banking same, it's a policy in the same sector in the banking sector but it's one acting on the demand for rather than the supply of safe assets. Third, you can eliminate expectations of future deflation. You have the Federal Reserve print up so much money that nobody thinks that prices could ever fall again on a large scale. And that will increase demand for real property and diminish demand for cash in your asset mix, um, which will get people to spend more. And there's expansionary fiscal policy as well have the government print up a huge honking additional tranche of government bonds, which are safe assets, you know, to really expand the supply of safe assets out there. And so push down their price, push up the interest rate. By pushing up the interest rate, you make holding treasuries more attractive and so induce people to spend the cash. Now, all of these are kind of Rube Goldberg mechanisms, right? All of them are rather complicated ways of getting spending up and we really wish we could use the normal way of getting spending up, which is simply to trade bonds for cash, get more cash in people's pockets and have them burn, burn a hole in them and have them start spending it. The problem is right now we're in a situation where we fear that particular channel doesn't work. So we have to do something else. Um, and these are all what the government has been doing, um, however imperfectly, however ineptly, right, for a year now. And you can make an awful lot of criticisms um, of the way things have been implemented. And you can point that all of these policies have grave risks. Um, government guarantees, well, produce moral hazard um, in the sense that people no longer have an incentive to guard carefully when to think carefully about what they invest in to do due diligence because the government's guaranteed it. We got into big trouble with the savings and loans because they had a government guarantee in 1990. We don't want to do that again. The government guarantee policy, which has the benefit of expanding the supply of risky of safe assets, also creates bad incentives for the financial organizations that receive the government guarantee to then go out and do excessively risky things that the taxpayer will pay for in the long run. Banking recapitalization. Um, well, that's a direct way of rewarding the bad actors. 
That is, I've lost 95% of the equity value of big bank, and now the government's going to give me more money to play with. That's not the way finance or any industry is supposed to work. If you lose money, the, the new investing resources are then supposed to go to competitors who have a demonstrated ability to gain money. Um, unfortunately, the only institutions with a demonstrated ability to gain money in the current environment are Goldman Sachs and J.P. Morgan Chase, and the belief was to let every other bank fail while the government pours all of the TARP money into J.P. Morgan Chase and Goldman Sachs, um, that that would have produced an even worse world than the one we currently live in, that you had to prop up the weak sisters to some degree, or wind up with a gigantic oligopoly in which two enormous banks, uh, enormous Paris state banks had made unbelievable fortunes um, for their CEOs and their top executives. No one really wanted to go there. Eliminate expectations of future deflation. Well, the obverse to that is you're creating potential, exp potential expectations of future inflation. And we had inflation in the 1970s and we didn't like it much. Expansionary fiscal policy. Um, well, the government needs, over the long run, to be taxing more relative to its spending, not less. And the task of moving from a world in which you spend more relative to taxes in the short run to the long run world in which you tax more relative to what you spend, well, that's a very delicate one. And you run the risk of starting with a stimulus program now and ending with a much larger structural deficit later. Um, given these risks and given uncertainties, how much of each of these extraordinary stimulative policies should we be doing? Um, that's, um, that's a hard question. Um, but I think the clear answer to it is that we ought to be doing more. That is, unemployment rate nationwide is likely to be stuck around 10% or so for the next 15 months. It may be better, it may be worse, it probably will be. Forecasts are imperfect, the world never comes out like them. But it's as likely to grow above 10% as below. And the unemployment rate ought to be 5% or so. Um, the unemployment rate ought to be 5% or so. So there's a sense in which we're on an unsatisfactory path and we should be doing more. One illustration, right back at the start of September 2008, Larry Summers, speaking for the Obama campaign, said that it was clear the economy did need right, aggressive and extraordinary stimulative policies. And he carefully didn't put forward a number, but he did put forward a number for the gap, for the cumulative three-year gap he expected to see between demand and what he thought normal employment demand would be. He said that was $900 billion. And if you think that um, filling half the gap is a reasonable goal for fiscal policy, given all the other things that are going on, that would imply a $450 billion or so fiscal policy stimulus package over three years or so. We actually wound up getting a $600 billion package. Right? The 787 headline numbers deceiving 180 of that are tax cuts for yuppies living in states with high sales taxes, which no one thinks will have any stimulative effect at all. Um, so we went from 450 billion at the start of September to 600 billion when the Obama stimulus was enacted in February. Uh, but in mid-September, we had the collapse of Lehman Brothers and of AIG, and the magnitude of our problem had doubled. That if a 450 billion dollar stimulus had been appropriate before Lehman Brothers, a 900 billion would have been appropriate afterwards. And then in December and January, it became clear that the Lehman collapse was having bigger impacts than anyone had expected. And we were facing not just three months of complete economic collapse, but six, which would say that you should double it again, um, that the right metric for how large the stimulus package should have been was on 1.8 trillion. Um, instead, we're winding up with 600 billion, which is kind of one third of where we would really ought to be in the ideal world of economic policy technocracy. Um, 600 billion is also a stimulus package that attracted 60 and only 60 senators, or 61 and only 61 senators to vote for it. And any bigger stimulus package would have failed to pass at all. And the response of the Obama administration is that 600 billion is better than zero. 
um, even if you do accept, which they say they do not, um, or at least not publicly, my arguments that it should be 1.8, should have been 1.8 trillion. Um, what's going to happen in the future? Well, for the future, it really depends on which of the three live sides win the intellectual argument, um, win the intellectual cage match. The producerist side, the side that says we need to very tightly regulate finance, um, well, they have to deal with the fact that regulating finance means you're prohibiting voluntary transactions between adults who are supposed to know what they're doing. You're having the Federal Reserve tell people who want to lend and people who want to borrow that they can't make deals. Um, you're telling people the Federal Reserve, you're saying the Fed Federal Reserve is telling people who want to, um, let's say venture capitalists, they, they can't invest in high tech. Um, there's a feeling that you try to run policies that tell people they can't do things in America and those aren't politically sustainable, you won't get very long. And the argument against the producerist claim that high finance is a cruel hoax is that yes, it's a hoax, but it's a more or less benevolent hoax. That the behavioral finance economists tell us that portfolio holders are excessively worried about risks and so are likely to adopt excessive caution. The behavioral consumer finance economists tell us that consumers are excessively greedy and impatient. And so a little deception, a little salesmanship, a little kind of how about this complex derivative security to get you to hold a more risky and a longer run portfolio, that these really are in the interest of American savers, even though they wouldn't choose such things voluntarily if they had all their information. I don't know how powerful these arguments against the producerists will turn out to be. Um, intellectually, I find the second one to be stronger. Politically, I suspect the first one um, is likely to be the strongest. So I expect the producerist side to kind of go down and not to be very strong in the fight over what we're going to do. Um, the arguments against Greenspanism, well, you know, shutting your eyes and saying it didn't really happen, uh, we can ignore that. Pay no attention to that man behind the curtain. Pay no attention to that financial crisis and that recession we just went through. Everything's fine. Um, it's not an attractive posture, and it's an even less attractive posture rhetorically than it is intellectually. Um, you can make an intellectual case that maybe, just maybe, you can, we should stand up and carry on as usual. Um, I don't think you can make the case politically or rhetorically. I also expect the Greenspanists um, to go down. You know, um, the arguments against the punch bowlers are that having the Federal Reserve worry not just about inflation getting too high, but also about asset prices getting too high that that's going to create extra unemployment. Um, you know, that is pushing asset prices down whenever the Federal Reserve thinks they ought to be a little bit higher. Um, that's kind of when, the, when demand is not out of whack with aggregate supply. Um, that leaves a lot of Americans without jobs for no reason other than we don't trust the financiers to control themselves and to behave rationally. And to say there has to be a better way to defend against irrational exuberance in financial markets than by attacking American workers. Um, nevertheless, I expect the punch bowlers in the end to carry the day, if only for institutional bureaucratic reasons. That this policy is one the Federal Reserve can enact on its own through its own internal decisions. That if it decides to move in this direction, Congress would have to block it and would have a difficult time doing so. And one thing that the finance, subprime financial crisis is going to do is it's going to make the Federal Reserve say, let's never let that happen again. That just as the time since 1982 has seen a Federal Reserve say, we are never going to let the 1970s come again. So the Federal Reserve will now say um, that we're never going to let the 2007 come again. So I expect the future to see an American economy with somewhat higher unemployment, somewhat slower growth, somewhat lower asset prices, um, much more stable financial markets, and one in which the gap between our growth, our potential economic potential and economic actuality is somewhat larger. 
Uh, but at the moment, I see no way of avoiding this because I see no way of making the other two, either of the other two positions more attractive, either intellectually um, or politically and rhetorically. And with that downer message, let me stop there. And thank you all very much.